once the election is over, they have certainty. You know, September, October tend to be iffy months historically for risk assets, certainly stock market. But getting through that election, I think there's a very strong chance that you see markets continue to rip into year end as the election comes to a close. Hey everyone, this episode is brought to you by Mantra, the security first, compliance focused L1, which is onboarding the next wave of financial institutions. You're going to be hearing all about them later in the show. But for now, Mantra, thanks for making this episode possible. All right. Welcome back to another episode of On the Margin. And joining me today is Joe McCann, founder and CEO of Asymmetric Fund. What's going on? How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to discuss a bit more about what you do at Asymmetric, because I think you sit at a really interesting intersection of both macro and crypto that a lot of what we talk about on the margin is really focusing in on that. And it's something that I'm really passionate about is really operating that barbell world of being deep in the macro and deep in the trenches in crypto. What does that look like to have a macro overlay on an early stage crypto fund? And you know, what are some examples? How do you use that as a risk overlay? Um, or do you see it as more of a way to basically press risk higher further? But would love to just unpack a bit more about your philosophy and how that actually operates. At, at Asymmetric, you know, we're a digital assets investment firm. We have a, a you know, long, short discretionary hedge fund and then uh, two early stage venture capital funds. Um, on the hedge fund side is really where the macro comes in. I mean, it does somewhat on the venture side, but because venture is a, a much longer time horizon, it's it's less relevant versus the kind of quick changes that happen in the market uh, as it relates to the hedge fund. So the the you know the way that we view macro and look, I, I've been I've been a trader and a technologist for twenty four years now, uh, and my trading partner um, has inc- incredibly deep. Uh, level of expertise and understanding of macro. He, he managed a billion and a quarter at Revan Howard, global macro, cross asset, cross geo. Uh, it's been in the space for over 20 years. So between the two of us, we have, you know, I don't want to sound like nobody in crypto knows macro, but we have a very specific and I think differentiated view on macro as it relates to how we invest in crypto. And so macro for us is really the guardrails for how we think about what's going to happen with risk assets, particularly crypto, and what are the best ways to express our macro views using crypto? Um, technically, we can trade other you know, products on the CME, et cetera, rates, FX, whatever. But for the most part, um, we only trade digital assets. And the beauty of this for us is if you get the macro right, you get the crypto right, is what we always say. And um, you know, I know I was on with Raul Paul on Real Vision uh, last month, and he says everything is macro, and I, I I tend to agree. And so this, as a guiding principle for us, has been very, very, very effective um, because uh, as we looked when we launched the fund in <laughs> June of 2022, literally like 10 days before Three Arrows collapse and everything else that happened in 2022, our view was pretty dark. We were pretty bearish. Um, in fact, we expressed that view via put spreads into Q4. We were actually short heading into Q4 of 2022. Um, fixed risk, though, we're not we're not stupid enough to short anything crypto. Um, and we were right. You know, look, uh, we, we've got our monthly market updates that we put out. Anybody can subscribe to them. It's subscribe.asymmetric.financial. You can go all the way back to when we first started publishing them in August of 2022. And our, our macro view has largely been the same and ultimately correct. We, we predicted in September of 2022 that the Fed would stop hiking rates between 5 and 6%. They stopped at 5.5%. Um, we also took the view that global liquidity had bottomed in October of 2022. And global liquidity has uh, ultimately been, I think, the most obvious thing for propelling risk assets and inflating the value of risk assets. Uh, so we got very, very long in late December of 2022. And again, this is all through our macro lens. And so the macro piece, um, as we sit today, and, and we've kind of been pounding the drum on this since, frankly, April, we think uh, the, that cuts are coming. We think rate cuts are coming. Um, that is oddly non-consensus, except for like with the CIO of BlackRock. <laughs> So, uh, you know, so and we we believe this to be true because as we look at things like the Federal Reserve and and their their dual mandate, it's it's not just inflation; it's also employment. And so, employment data has started to roll. Um, there's like a huge discrepancy between the household survey and the NFP. Um, unemployment data is ticking up. You have massive uh, illegal and legal immigration in the United States, um, kind of affecting things like the NFP uh, number. 
that I don't think a lot of people are paying attention to. Is and as you kind of dig into the details, mostly I say most importantly, um, the revisions that are coming from the the previous headlines. Like that's the stuff that no one tends to care about because it doesn't draw eyeballs to a website or a TV show. Like you look at the headline number and you're like, oh, you know, PCE is this or NFP is that. But then it's like, wait, well, what were the revisions? All the revisions are coming in negative across the board. And so, you know, we're using this again as a guiding principle for how we are, are investing in the digital asset space. Because as you move uh, further out the risk curve, uh, crypto is the furthest on the risk curve. So what's the optimal way of kind of expressing um, a view that you think risk assets are going to go up in value? Well, it's probably crypto. And so for now, we remain bullish. Uh, Q2 has been clearly choppy. We had you know the April pullback, May bounced back, June thus far is a drawdown and, and choppiness. We anticipated this. Q2 is historically the worst performing quarter for Bitcoin and crypto generally. We anticipated you know a choppy quarter. We do think the second half of the year has uh, a much brighter horizon in terms of the value of risk assets rising going forward. I'd love to just circle a bit back to some of the beginning points you made about your process and how crypto and macro intertwine together. I think an interesting point that you mentioned, it sounds like instead of, you know, if you're you know, midterm bearish on crypto for whatever reason, instead of expressing that by outright shorting, you know, crypto assets that just, you know, have huge asymmetric upside and I think pretty big tail risks, would you express that instead as say, you know, buying QQQ puts or something like that instead? Because that's something I've thought a lot about. And I think that's that's a really interesting proposition. Yeah, I mean, it's it's fascinating you say that. I was chatting with a buddy of mine who runs a, a large book at a TradFi hedge fund in uh, in New York. Uh, and momentum has been absolutely s- just smashing it this year. Uh, NASDAQ, as we sit here today, hitting new all-time highs, even as it's utterly overbought, right? And, you know, the the breadth in that is not great. We see, you know, the, the leaders, things like NVIDIA, um, of course, and other large tech companies, really uh, Microsoft, et cetera, really taking the, the the charge here for for newer highs. I think Nvidia is now going to be twenty percent of the XLK ETF, which is a QQQ, you know, alternative. I mean, um, it's it's hard to look at uh, something like the Nasdaq and be bearish. Now, you you could tactically, you know, buy some put spreads or or or. Um, hedge your positions with with something like what you're describing. The problem with that with crypto is that crypto is so small relative to something like the NASDAQ or the, uh, the US equities or global equities that a lot of folks tend to try to correlate the two. And, and there are cases absolutely that, the, that crypto has correlated with the NASDAQ. Um, however, last week, for example, we had... Um, uh, I would say favorable economic data from the CPI PPI that was suggesting that you know inflation is continuing lower, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, you know the stock market, Nasdaq particularly, ripped higher. Yet crypto went down, right? And so, from our perspective, the you know if you look at Nasdaq as a proxy to crypto, and like why not just like buy puts against that? Is like I just the, the correlation hasn't been strong enough to justify. Yeah. Yeah, not consistent enough either. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, um, if you're long, say, Solana and you want to hedge that by buying QQQ puts, you may be disappointed. It might work, but you may be disappointed. And and clearly there are cases like when, you know, there was the uh, Israeli-Iran kind of semi-quasi-conflict in April, all risk assets went down. That's all algorithmically driven. Those idiosyncrasies are risk off, I think, in general. So yeah, a correlation of one kind of makes sense. But here it's it's more difficult. Um, a lot of it, a lot of it is is liquidity based. Like if you look at the spot volumes of crypto for like the past, I would say this in almost this entire quarter, certainly May and June, they're anemic. That's also driving a lot of the price action because when you have thin liquidity, you know, prices tend to drift lower. And so I'm not a hundred percent convinced that. Say hedging your crypto book by you know QQQ puts or even any proxy in the stock market is meaningful at this point, um, just because it's too small and the liquidity is too thin. Yeah, I think that's a really important distinction because I think if you hear about okay, you know, you're a guy that runs a crypto first hedge fund, but with a macro overlay, you're like okay, so you're just using crypto as like high beta risk exposure, but it's not that. There's more to it underneath the surface. I'd love to use that idea as a jumping off point to 
you know, what are your fundamental views on the crypto space in general? You know, obviously it's, it can be, it's very sensitive to liquidity and liquidity conditions, as we mentioned, especially like global macro liquidity, but I'd love to just hear a bit more about what are those other drivers that make it that much more idiosyncratic? What is the sentiment on crypto Twitter today, right? <laughs> so so yeah. look, I mean, like one of the things that has always drawn me to crypto is that on the one hand, it's like a renaissance for traders again. You know, I used to trade on the street years ago and I left because all the trading was moving to machines and algorithms. And that's clearly what is running markets these days, uh, traditional markets. Um, so the renaissance of trading in crypto is great. You also have people that have never traded anything except crypto. And there's a whole culture around trading crypto from... You know, the insane levels of leverage that you can use um, to people so desperately wanting to be right and calling a top, which is just ridiculous, in my opinion, um, clout chasing on Twitter, these types of things. Right. Um, the other idiosyncras idiosyncrasies that I think are very specific to crypto is that it is it is Internet native. And, you know, traditional markets are not Internet native because they were around before the Internet existed. And with the. With crypto being internet native, you end up with narratives that drive price. And yes, narratives can drive price in, in traditional finance as well, but those markets are so mature and so liquid that it's it's much more difficult for um, some random news article to, to really affect uh, price, right? So one of the things that we try to look out for is what are the prevailing narratives or even forecastable narratives that could potentially pick up steam in in crypto and this could be anything from like you know liquid staking derivatives when you know ethereum was doing the Chappella upgrade to uh meme coins i mean pick something right the the reason that the I, I highlight that it's internet native and and the uniqueness to that is crypto is also a constantly evolving beast i mean cryptocurrency is programmable money it is literally software and so the types of innovations that can that can happen within crypto um, are extremely difficult to envisage. Very, very hard to see, and that's what's so fascinating about it to me is that you know I think uh, you know I'm obviously a big Solana bull, not a Solana maxi, but I'm big Solana bull, and it's largely because the types of applications that you can build with that blockchain are just fundamentally different than what you can build on Bitcoin and Ethereum. End of story. Yeah. And I don't think a lot of folks were able to kind of forecast like, hey, there's going to be this like airdrop on the Solana phone for this meme coin called Bonk. And all of a sudden there's an arbitrage ac across the phone because the airdrop is worth more than the phone. Like no one's forecasting that, but it happens. And that narrative can affect price. And I think so the net of this is you know, how how is it being Internet native and programmable? Um, affecting how things trade in the market. It's very, very hard to box that in, but being aware of it, I think is critical. Hey everyone, this episode is brought to you by Mantra, the security first, compliance focused L1, which is onboarding the next wave of financial institutions into Web3. So you guys heard me talk about Larry Fink talking about tokenization. You've seen the clips on CNBC. You know that Larry and BlackRock are very, very excited about this idea. And the reason for that is they're looking at these trillions of dollars of off-chain real world assets. They want to digitize those and bring them on-chain, which is going to be a massive opportunity. But in order to do that, they need a compliant L1, and that's where Mantra comes in. Mantra has been steadily climbing the ranks and now stands among the top four RWA projects on CoinGecko which is representative of its rapid growth and influence in the tokenization space. Mantra is built using the Cosmos SDK, so they have some very cool stuff out of the box. They've got IBC interoperability. They also leverage Cosmwasm smart contracts. Very cool design from an architectural standpoint. The next phase on the blockchain's testnet is Hongbai. So that's launching soon. So if you're a, a dApp developer or something like that, there's a lot of very cool opportunities for you. And I highly recommend that you click the link at the bottom of the show notes. I don't know that I sent you. Uh, thanks very much again, Mantra, for making this possible. And again, guys, click the link at the bottom of the show notes. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think, you know, just to level set a bit on, you know, what the typical journey is for, say, a macro first person. I mean, that's how I got into the space originally was looking at, okay, here's Bitcoin, which is this idea of uh, digital gold. Um, but you just express a lot of interesting, you know, other innovations that are occurring right now. Like you said, you're a big Solana bull. I'd really love to hear a bit more about other, you know, there's that whole side of things that's like that, you know, the, it, it's where, I don't know, consumer trends and culture are being elevated um, on the technology space. But I think there's also some really interesting dynamics of how that protocol can be useful for, you know, financial and like markets first types of people. 
Um, for the for the person who's you know just mostly looked at crypto as okay, there's Bitcoin, digital gold, and then all this other weird stuff. You know, what's what's the tangible case that you see for that financial innovation? I'm not going to use the logical fallacy of appealing to authority here, but I think it is worth pointing out that Visa and Jump are focusing on Solana. I, I don't know, like Jump Trading, the most profitable market maker algorithmic trading firm in the history of the world is focusing on Solana. I, you know, like, I, and that's I, because I, they, you the, know, they have higher throughput and those sort of things that make it more useful for them. Right. Yeah. I mean, look, like what is their business? Their business is making markets and, and uh, out of the things that um, exist currently today uh, and have existed, I should say, because obviously there's things like SWE and Aptos and things that are coming like Monad and we're investors in say, right? But but for the, the longest time, um, Solana has been the thing that is drawn that someone like Jump would be drawn to because if things are gonna if all things are gonna be tokenized, which I believe they will be at in some capacity, they're gonna trade on chain and they're gonna need people to make markets for them. Well, what is Jump's core competency? Making markets, right? And they they're really, really good at it. And furthermore, um, you know, uh, Kevin Bowers recently did an amazing podcast interview about Fire Dancer, which is the Solana validator client that they're that they're working on um, and, and building from the ground up to enable effectively a million transactions per second on commodity hardware. Um, this is simply not possible on any other L1 today. Now we can talk about L2s and L3s and this and that, but that's that's besides the point. Those are not apples to apples comparison. If you look at an L1 versus another L1, Solana is the only thing that can actually do that today and furthermore will enable that in the future with with things like uh uh fire dancer which is the validator client that, that jump is working on so what are the financial use cases i mean i don't know what 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 isn't a financial use case at that point right like if you can make a market for effectively anything and the speed of light is the bottleneck that's kind of like traditional markets right so use your imagination you're going to be you know, you're going to see things like I recently got an email the other day of somebody looking to tokenize mortgage-backed securities, right? MBSs. Is, is that going to happen? Probably. Uh, you already see stuff like uh, tokenized gold and these other types of uh, real-world assets that they're looking to tokenize. I mean, USDC is literally tokenized US treasuries and cash, right? So um, these things are coming. And it, it is difficult for me today as I sit here to determine that that's going to be on Ethereum's L1. Uh, it's just not. It's a physics problem. It's not going to happen. Um, and you can see this with the companies that are looking to build this type of stuff. They're not gravitating towards um, ideology, which drives a lot of the narrative around Ethereum, which is max decentralization and let's, you know, let's let's upend the current financial system. And it's not like I empathize with that. I just operate in the real world. And the real world doesn't work that way. And and when you use ideology to kind of drive technical decision makings. You don't end up with a product or a, or a service that is going to be ultimately uh, widely adopted. And I think that Solana has done a, a really good job of not only managing through the cycles, but managing through the FUD. Uh, and the teams just keep building. And this is, you know, as a technologist, a former CEO of an open source infrastructure company, raised venture for it and sold it, et cetera. Like, that's what I look for. What are developers can, in, in the roughest of times? You know, the FTX implosion, the Solana's trading down to $8. What are they doing? They're still building. And that to me is is a testament to the types of uh, opportunities that exist currently today in the Solana ecosystem, let alone what could be done for like, you know, the financial use cases. I think the financial use cases are, are super obvious from stablecoin payment transfers, which is super fast and obvious, to making markets in effectively anything that would be tokenized. I mean, all you have to do is listen to Larry Fink at BlackRock, where he's just saying, you know, the next big wave is tokenizing everything. And, you know, he's 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 the guy at the center of that for, you know, financial, basically, packages. Um, Let, let's be clear, like, the, BlackRock, everybody knows them as $10 trillion asset manager, largest asset manager on the planet, et cetera, et cetera. Great. They're effectively an extension of the Fed and U.S. Treasury. And I think a lot of people miss that, right? And so, you know, you, you can, you can uh, try to intelligently debate why they are wrong, they are an extension of the US Treasury and the Fed, and they have $10 trillion in assets. And if they're telling you that they're going to launch a Bitcoin spot ETF like they did in June of 2023, it's coming. If they're telling you all of these things are going to be tokenized, it's coming. I can assure you of that, right? And 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 I think the evidence supports that. So we've talked a lot about this more technological innovation side of crypto. Where does 
Bitcoin fit into everything for you? I know you focused, um, you know, on scaling for Bitcoin, either Bitcoin L2s, some of the, you know, tokenization things that are going on there. Do you view Bitcoin through that lens of digital gold and how does it relate into your macro thesis? Back in, oh man, it's late 2019, um, me and my buddy, Balaji Srinivasan, were kind of co-authoring this piece on what we call the future of truth or the future of trust. Um, and it was right before COVID happened. We never published it because COVID happened, but um, we needed to have, we should have published it because the amount of misinformation and lack of trust accelerated uh, post COVID. And my hypothesis was it's, it, you know, we're, we kind of like, especially after uh, Trump um, won the election uh, in um, 2016, uh, we were kind of like in this weird, like post-truth era because of social networks and misinformation campaigns. And, and you know, now certainly I, we've talked about it back then of deep fakes, et cetera. What does that do with Bitcoin? Well, my hypothesis is like, you kind of need a, uncoercible third party that uses math to verify the truth of something. And Bitcoin is very good at that. Very, very good at that. Now, its current use case is value transfer. And, and the narrative, of course, is now digital gold. But the core underlying technology enables truth to exist. You cannot fight math. Like You cannot deny math. Well, how do you get truth on chain? I think that's a, 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 that is a a huge topic that's probably worth you know an hour to discuss. But conceptually, if we live in this like internet dominated world where you're not really sure if what you're getting is like real news or if it's AI generated or you have no way of knowing and your perception is reality, well, how do you verify that kind of stuff? You can't verify it with an institution. People don't trust governments. They don't trust the CDC. They don't trust the WHO. They don't trust politicians. They don't trust libraries. They don't trust books, like et cetera, et cetera, right? And so what could we potentially agree on as a source of truth? Math. It's really hard to argue with math. And Bitcoin provides that. Now, what does that have to do with like how I think about investing in the space? Um, on the one hand, yes, no doubt Bitcoin is a, it's a digital representation of gold. Um, you know, we, we made a bunch of money on this in 2023. Like we, we predicted the, the regional bank crisis a month in advance. And we had a view that if we started to see stress in the regional bank sector, when there's stress in the financial system, people go to a flight to quality asset, which is typically gold. Well, now there's a digital version of that. And it, it worked. Bitcoin went from 19K to 30K in like three weeks, right? And, and that was because there was a rush towards uh, this kind of flight to quality digital gold alternative to gold. Um, and it worked. And so I think that there is something to be said about that uh, still to this day of like people parking their wealth in something like Bitcoin. In the United States, you know, I think we have a very uh, kind of myopic lens on what's happening around the rest of the world as it, as it relates to the devaluing of, of currencies or waking up and your bank account balance has been seized by the government or any of these types of things, right? War, you name it. Um, people can just have a USB stick or a piece of paper with a seed phrase on it. And now that is their, their protection of their wealth uh, and protection of their, their kind of like uh, income. Uh, I think that there is a lot more to be done there. Uh, I'd say finally though, as the institutional adoption of Bitcoin has finally arrived through the spot ETFs and otherwise, uh, this is going to accelerate. Um, we are, you know, we really haven't even had a rollout of you know Bitcoin spot ETFs being available for 401ks and retirement funds and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all this stuff is going to be coming. Um, that's going to be a passive bid into the market for things like Bitcoin. It's very difficult to see a world where Bitcoin has another 80% drawdown or something. It just seems very, very difficult to see. It's possible, of course, but like the tail risk on that seems re relatively low. The last thing I'll mention is, is what you described on like L2s and whatnot. Yes. So we have an early stage uh, Bitcoin DeFi venture fund. Uh, Dan Held, Bitcoin OG, recently joined the oh, yeah. firm to actually help me run that. And you know, he's been in the space... I mean, forever and knows everybody very, very uh, committed to Bitcoin, very knowledgeable about the space. And so our, our like hypothesis with this early stage uh, Bitcoin DeFi fund, venture fund, is we think what has happened in Ethereum and even Solana uh, as it relates to DeFi and just also the types of activities that exist on Ethereum and Solana is, is coming to Bitcoin, whether people like it or not. I know the Bitcoin maxis hate it, but guess what? It's a permissionless network. So it's coming. And so we want to invest in projects and companies and protocols and meta protocols. They're going to be 
ushering in new waves of innovation. Because if you get back to the very beginning of my conversation about this topic, it's a source of truth. And so if we can build layer twos or other meta protocols that, that can enable other types of interesting forms of decentralized finance or other types of activity on chain with Bitcoin as a settlement layer, I want to be absolutely uh, front and center in that. So knowing your fundamental views on a lot of things, I'd love to shift gears a little bit now towards uh, your market views for the rest of the year, starting with your macro theses. Early in the show, you mentioned that you think rates are coming, uh, rate cuts are coming, and that that's a non-consensus view. And it's funny, I'm largely in the same camp as you, but it's, it is quite interesting that that's uh, so non-consensus. Starting with that, why do you think rate cuts are coming? A couple things. Uh, one, you know, the Fed has dual mandate, employment and, and inflation. Um, we're starting to see cracks in employment data roll over over the past you know, X number of weeks, right? It's it's whatever, mid-June now, uh, it's starting back uh, from the, the, the May report, um, JOLTS data, um, if you dig into the, uh, the household survey, even NFP to some extent, I mean, the revisions that are coming in, folks have been so hyper-focused on the inflation narrative that they tend to forget that employment also actually matters. And so the Fed is literally telling us and has been that they want to cut rates, um, they need the data to support that. And so our view has been that eventually employment data is going to roll over. It's starting to. You're seeing some cracks in the economy. Um, on the one hand, I mean, they're not major cracks, but like you see like things like the ISM survey were you know, in, in contraction for months. Um, that's, that's not great. But the Fed isn't responsible for manufacturing, right? Th that's not their mandate. But it's also an election year. And historically, in election years in the United States, uh, you tend to have markets get juiced into the second half um, for whatever reason. I mean, you can we can tinfoil hat this all we want, but at the end of the day, the head of the U.S. Treasury and the head of the Federal Reserve, those are politically appointed positions. Do you think they want to keep their job? Probably. If they assume that the incumbent president is going to remain president, they probably want to do things in, in a way that is you know, supportive of that. Now, let's discount that to zero. Look at what's actually happening with real rates. They've been uh, sky high for a long time, and they continue to be. Uh, if we're seeing um, infl inflation data come lower, which it has on the latest CPI print, those real rates are even higher. And that is a restrictive environment. We can't continue to have that. E eventually, the Fed is going to have to cut rates um, to at least ease up on that. Because that will constrict the that will constrict the economy as well as potentially affect uh, employment. And you can look at even what's happened recently around like call it the more budget conscious consumer. You've got Taco Bell and Starbucks and McDonald's and Target and Amazon. They're all cutting prices. That's deflationary, right? Like this is actually happening. And so you know, risk assets have have continued to go up in value, but those are only those are owned by like you know, only 20% of the US citizens at this point, right? Like other folks are really struggling to, to, to make ends meet. And I don't think that uh, the Fed is actually going to uh, continue to create a such a restrictive environment that those folks are negatively impacted beyond where they already are today. The last thing I'll mention is um, we tend to focus heavily at asymmetric on global liquidity. And we actually mm -hmm. like uh, cross-border capital's approach to global liquidity. A lot of people think global liquidity is just like central bank balance sheets and the monetary yeah. policies associated with it. It's much more than that, right? It's shadow monetary base. It's uh, the, the collateral ratio as based on the move index, which is the, you know, the VIX for, 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 T or for treasuries. You start to look at historically when global liquidity starts to tick, tick back up, it's in the summer. Now we're just now kind of in the summer and and you know we have we starting to see like little hints of illiquidity improving on a weekly basis. July, August, like that's probably when we start to see it tick back up and then it's certainly into the 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 end of the year. So what does that mean with respect to rate cuts? We think and have thought since April there's at least two cuts coming this year. But we also think there's a non-zero chance that you see like almost what we call a maintenance cut in July, right? So if you have a, a, a handful of, of additional um, economic data points come in that suggest unemployment or excuse me, the employment market is, is weakening and inflation is coming lower. Like there's, there's, there's a good chance that maybe the fed does 50 bips out of the gate, right? There's, I don't think most people are positioned for that. And certainly the futures markets all. don't suggest no. that. And I would say that also like, yeah, Joe, yeah, right. They're going to cut 50 bips. I like, I, I mean, 
stranger things have happened. And and yeah. the the kind of asymmetry on that trade is pretty high, right? It's basically next to nothing to, to purchase 50 bips on mm-hmm. Fed Funds futures right now. And if you're right, you're a genius, you make a fortune. If you're wrong, all right, you take a little bit of PL loss and you wait till September. But ultimately, we think that there's a non-zero chance that there's a cut in July, could be a maintenance cut of 50 bips. But September and, and December, from our perspective, seem very, very likely uh, given how the economic data post FOMC has come in, um, you know, kind of rolling over and, and uh, causes some stress in the employment uh, market. Hello, hello, listeners of On The Margin. I've got good news for those of you who are in the crypto scene. BlockWorks is bringing back Permissionless. We're going to be doing Permissionless 3. And this year we are heading west. So we're moving that out to Salt Lake City. That's going to be October 9th through 11th this year. We've got a phenomenal lineup of speakers for you. So we've got Balaji headlining. We've got Sriram, Munib, Matt Hogan of Bitwise, Jan Van Eck. This one's going to be a blast, guys. And I saw many of you out in London for a DAS this year, and I hope to see you out in Salt Lake for permissionless. And because y'all are such faithful listeners, we've got if you use code MARGIN10, you're going to get 10% off your tickets. Appreciate you all. Hope to see you out there. I largely sh- share the same view on most of that. And I know I personally last week got caught off pretty got off guard um, from the Fed's meeting where they came out with their dot plot update and basically said that they're going to only cut once. At their previous dot plot meeting three, four months ago, they were going to say three cuts. Market expected that they go down to two, but they went down to one. That coming off the end of a really soft CPI print, you know, I was like, okay, like a couple cuts are coming for sure, at least. So that caught off me off guard. What did you take from that? Yeah, I mean, look, the 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 fact that CPI was on the same day as FOMC is is rare, but it does happen. And, um, you know, it, like, if you listen to the presser, with pa- what Powell was saying, somebody asked him, like, did you guys make the decision based on the CPI number that came out? And technically, you know, they, they can adjust their, uh, their views on the dots and or, you know, the current rate cut environment. But he even said, like, most people don't. And so what I take away from that is, is that the decisions that they made to go from three to one on the dot plot was based on information prior to that CPI p- print. Um, do, do we, do, did I expect that they would go from three to one? No, but I also don't expect them to, um, I don't expect any of the members uh, of, of the board to have changed their perspective based on the CPI print. Um, it's just rare that that would happen. It's certainly possible, but it's rare that that would happen. So we were like, we were caught off guard to the extent that three went down to one on the dots. But what we weren't caught off on guard was the fact that this data hadn't been factored into um, that report. And so from our perspective, you know, the way that he handled the press conference, I mean, he wasn't hawkish, you know, so uh, and, and, you know, I, I, I really don't believe that um, with that kind of a CPI print, they could be hawkish going forward, uh, especially if we continue to get data that su- suggests the fact that inflation is continuing to roll that GDP may be coming lower, that unemployment is ticking up. Um, this suggests to us that like there's prob- two cuts is probably the, the right number for the Fed. The DOS just didn't suggest it. And to be fair, it's really close. It's just how like the median is calculated. They're very close to being at two cuts there too. It's just right. You know, it's just noise, honestly. Like, but to me, it sounds like that sets up for a lot of potential for upside surprises in markets. Do you agree? Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. I mean, this is why I was saying the asymmetry in like a 50 bips maintenance cut for July is such a great trade if you're willing to to, to put it on. Right. Um, this is not financial advice, of course. But like you look at that and say, hey, if the Fed funds futures markets are only pricing like one cut or two cuts and then there's this potential asymmetry because you could have some surprise from economic data or PCE comes really low. There's another CPI print ahead of the next Fed meeting. Like, I don't know. I mean, it feels like a decent yeah, hundred to one trade sure sounds good, right? So, um, so yeah, I do think that there is the potential for uh, upside surprises for sure, um, just because of the way that the economic data is coming in, especially with all the revisions. Uh, the headline is the piece that never really um, people trade off the headlines. The media loves to cover the headlines, but if you dig into the details, there's much more happening under the surface that I don't think is accurately priced in the market. And you still have so many people. I mean, Rick San- when Rick Santelli loses his mind on, on CNBC, that's when you know that things are moving in the right direction <laughs> because there's so many folks on FinTwit right now that so desperately want there to be a collapse, that so desperately want there to be further rate hikes so that they can be right. And it's just not going to happen. 
the, the markets are just not set up for something like that. And they've been holding at this level for so long. It's been restricted for so long that something's got to get. And so the potential for these upside surprises, I think, is actually pretty big. The bear case that I often hear from folks is that, oh, rate cuts are actually bearish. Like every time the Fed starts their cutting cycle, markets go down. How do you how do you square that one? It, it's I don't know. It's nonsense. <laughs> Look, like think about it just conceptually. If if the Fed is cutting rates, they're 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 increasing liquid available liquidity in the markets. Now you could have some idiosyncratic event where that day or that week equities go down. But I mean, equities have been on a freaking tear this year, so any reason for equities to pull back probably makes sense. But even like uh, I think it was last week or a couple weeks ago, into the close there was constant institutional buying, real money. Doesn't they're not fast money like hedge funds, right? Real money buying is is real. It's real money. They're they're buying real size and allocating appropriately to that. And so, if folks think that uh, a, a rate cut announced by the Fed is going to somehow detonate the markets, maybe the algos trade on it, right? The momentum yeah. ignition algos love to uh, abuse the markets, and you know Jane Street and those guys are really really good at that. <laughs> so. Kudos, right? Like, good for you. Um, but I don't believe that, uh, you know, conceptually saying a rate cut is actually going to put some top in the markets. The markets, the stock market particularly has been running super, super hot. But there is the potential that we're in like a, dare I call it, like a super cycle or, or just like a, a, on a cycle basis, this thing has a lot more room to run before you actually see some sort of material pullback. And I don't think that's going to be rate cut sensitive. I think People are actually pricing in potentially two rate cuts later this year. Stock market keeps making all-time highs. Yeah. I think what a lot of people miss too is, you know, they look at the simplistic thinking of, oh, rate cuts bearish. But if you actually look at the data, it's it depends on why they're cutting the rates. You know, if they're cutting rates because COVID is happening, obviously markets are going down. But if you look at, I don't know, like 2019 when they, you know, Powell was talking about a mid-cycle adjustment, which to me, that's my analog right now is, you know, that was actually super bullish and we just exploded higher, up, you know, and I don't really see a recession risk. I don't know if you do. No, I don't. Um, I mean, look, anything can happen, but... Uh... I, I, there's the 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 idea that we are approaching a recession right now feels like a stretch, just because the, a lot of the data doesn't support it. Um, you could probably see GDP come down for various reasons, and I think some of the like the Atlanta Fed recently reduced their their GDP number or their forecast. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be in some contraction environment where GDP is negative or that we're in a full blown recession. I mean, people have been calling for a recession since COVID, you know, uh, Fed went from zero to 550 bips in a year and there's no recession, right? Like, I mean, in fact, employment data up until recently has just been booming. Um, our average hour, hourly earnings continue to increase. Uh, you know, the consumer has not slowed down up until recently, like, like the more budget conscious consumer. And so I do think that um, in order for there to be like a full blown recession, you probably need some idiosyncratic event to trigger that that uh, isn't going to be supported by the markets. But I mean, think about it this way, right? Assume you have some other COVID or World War III nonsense that somebody's going to put out there. What do you think the Fed's going to do? <laughs> They're going to cut rates, right? And as you cut rates, you continue to provide liquidity to the market. And look, I, I think another thing that is that is probably not spoken of a, as often or, or certainly not um, mentioned frequently is the federal government makes money off of taxes. That's the business of the federal government. And how do they get paid uh, from these taxes? Well, the majority of their income comes from capital gains taxes. Well, where do capital gains taxes come from? They come from assets. Well, how do they get more money from these assets? They have to inflate the value of them. How do you inflate the value of them? You cut rates and you do, you know, what the US Treasury is doing by controlling kind of the long end of the curve right here, right? Like, you know, it's not that difficult to figure out uh, if you just pull like a little bit under the hood and see like, look, at some point, they're going to have to do this, whether it's idiosyncratically or it's a, you know, it's a measured approach. And if the economy starts to look like it's going into a recession ahead of an election, my God, you got to believe that there's going to be maintenance cuts coming. Yeah, I love that idea. I mean, I can't really think of a better outcome for everybody than stocks go up and everybody gets their share and everybody's happy. Nobody's complaining versus like, I don't know, austerity or something like that. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that you, you know, just thinking about the your, your near term to end of year outlook for markets. You mentioned, you know, generally going into the election day. 
uh, markets generally trend higher. What do you view for the rest of the year for, say, Bitcoin and Solana and those markets? Um, and do you subscribe to any sort of cycle theory or how do you derive those price targets? Yeah. So first, um, when everybody, anybody ever asks me a price target, I just say higher. Uh, I think price targets are nonsense. They're just a marketing invention by Wall Street to help sell side research sell stuff. Uh, this is pointless. Like somebody putting a price target on something is just ridiculous. Our view uh, since you know, basically like December of 2023 was here's how we're looking at 2024. We think Q- Q1 was going to be an absolute ripper, uh, mostly because of the ETF news and also just new money coming in, new year. Turned out to be true. Q2, we had a we had a view which is playing out now that you know it's going to be choppy. We've got uh, you know Bitcoin historically uh, is is. It's the least, the worst performing quarter is Q2, and you know, if tax loss selling, yeah, the having like pick pick your narrative, but Q2 is is usually choppy, and so we we position ourselves for that uh, going forward. You know, our view ha- is Q3. We think um, Bitcoin dominance probably tops somewhere, and altcoins actually have uh, a resurgence. This is also when global liquidity starts to tick up, right? At least that's the forecast. Um, so yes, you could see money flow to Bitcoin, but people are going to go further out the risk curve and end up buying alts is, is our perspective. Q4, we also then think Bitcoin starts to rally again. Um, not really sure where it goes with regards to, to dominance. It depends on what happens with Q3 with altcoins, but ultimately Q4, like you're going to, you can always look at like the kink in the, in the term structure of the VIX around a, a, an election, like end of October, November timeframe, but markets, you know, markets don't like uncertainty. Once the election is over, they have certainty. And so even in 2016, when Trump was elected, a lot of people folks said, if he wins, the markets are going to crash. They went straight up, right? Because the market needed the certainty and they, the, the election was over. And so, again, our perspective is, is as we kind of like, you know, September, October tend to be iffy months historically for risk assets, certainly stock market. Um, but getting through that election, I think you see, uh, I think there's a very strong chance that you see markets continue to rip into year end uh, as the election comes to a close. Well, look, I really enjoyed our talk today, Joe. I'd love to just end in hearing a few either tips or lessons that you've had from being somebody that trades crypto through a macro lens uh, for people that are, you know, going through that journey from macro first into crypto, as opposed to, you know, just opening the Robinhood account and trying to get rich quick on it. Meme coin. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you, you got you got to have like macro and meme coins as your barbell. People always ask me like, what books did you read and on like how to become a trader and investor? And I literally have read nothing on this on the space, which is disappointing, I think, for most people. Um, I just am super curious about these how markets work, um, the the financial plumbing of the the global financial system, uh, and so if you have a macro background or a macro understanding, then it's just figuring out what's the optimal expression of your view from macro. And it, I mean, it could be steepeners <laughs> or it could be, you know, buying a meme coin. Yeah. I think the, the the tip really is, is like one of the things that we try to do a really good job of at Asymmetric is not uh, what's known as style drift. We, we don't try to drift away from what we're good at, right? And for us, we use macro as a guiding principle and then look for the optimal expression through, through crypto. And so that could be buying spot tokens, NDFs, options, futures, you know, stuff on chain, you name it. As you're, you know, if, if you're a listener and you're, you're relatively savvy with macro, I think it probably makes sense to start with something as simple as Bitcoin and then start to build a, a, like an understanding and a portfolio around like, well, okay, well, what's beta to Bitcoin? And then what's beta to that? And what's beta to that? And then how do I express the view most appropriately relative to my understanding of macro? That's what I would do. And that's what we've done. And it's, it's worked for us and it, and it will continue to work for us um, as we kind of maintain that, that type of style as it relates to investing in crypto. Awesome. And that's some great advice. Well, thanks for joining us, Joe. That was really great. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. 